We'll be getting started at four o'clock in approximately two minutes. Thank you for signing in. We should get started shortly. Thank you. Good afternoon. If I could ask all of our panelists to take their places, please, so we can get started promptly at four o'clock. I'd appreciate it. Thank you. And Commissioner Bonner, if you're there, there we go. Very good, it is four o'clock um, and I should probably just start with a sound check. Um, can members of the panel advise you can hear me, correct? Yes, okay. Uh, well, good afternoon. My name is Eileen Decker and I'm the president of the Los Angeles Board of Police Commissioners. Welcome and thank you for attending this virtual forum today. We're very sorry that circumstances do not allow us to sit in the same room together across the table to have a more direct conversation on police reform. We do sincerely hope, however, that we can do that in the near future. And importantly, that you're all staying safe during this pandemic. I'm joined this afternoon by my colleague on the Board of Police Commissioners, Commissioner Dale Bonner. Thank you, Mr. Bonner, for being here. And the other members of the Board of Police Commissioners, Steve Soberoff, Shane Murphy, Goldsmith, and the newest member of the board, Lou Kalanche, will join at future forums. Uh, but today, Commissioner Mbonner and I are also joined by Richard Tifank, the Executive Director of the Commission, who is invaluable in all the work that we do and in organizing this forum. And also behind the scenes, Maria Silva and Rebecca Munoz, thank you very much for all of your help in organizing this. Significantly this afternoon, we're also joined by several members of the recently formed Advisory Committee on Building Trust and Equity, a group of people convened to assist in accelerating the work of the Police Commission. And today we're joined by Byron McLean and Rasha Shields. Byron and Rasha, I'm pleased to say, agreed to serve as co-chairs of the Advisory Committee. In addition, members of the committee here today are Octavio Pedroza and Alma Derricks. I wanna thank all the members of the advisory committee for accepting the invitation to serve and especially to those here tonight, thank you. Not all the members of the advisory committee are present this evening at each of these forums or listening sessions, a different combination of members of the commission and members of the advisory committee will attend, all of whom have access to the recordings of these meetings. By doing it in this way, we hope to have more meetings in a more condensed period of time. With respect to the advisory committee, there are 16 people in total on the committee. They represent a coalition, a collection of policy specialists, legal experts, and community leaders who I have charged with assisting in conducting a comprehensive review of LAPD policies and procedures and reform proposals that are being presented around the country and delivering to the commission recommendations for additional reforms. In short, I've asked them to assist in accelerating the work of the police commission. Their efforts are compatible with and complementary to the ongoing efforts of the commission in its oversight role. But specifically, I've asked the advisory committee for their assistance in five areas, a review of discipline and accountability, assessing current police reform proposals being considered throughout the country, evaluating the implementation of past LAPD reform proposals, examining the LAPD's recruitment, hiring, retention, and training process, and analyzing data collection and retention practices. These, of course, are not the exclusive areas that are important for police reform, but they are independently and collectively important for mapping out the future for the Commission's work in its oversight of the LAPD. 
And these are areas that I believe and I certainly hope are areas in which significant progress can be made in the months ahead. Not coincidentally, those are also the five areas that we have asked to uh, each of the speakers to address this evening. And we look forward to hearing from all of the speakers. We are here this afternoon and into this evening because of the important moment in time that we are in. And we're here because the last few months have highlighted what many have been saying for a long time, that more must be done, much more must be done. And that enough has not been accomplished in the area of police reform. As former President Obama once said, when any part of the American family does not feel like it is being treated fairly, that's a problem for all of us. It's not just a problem for some, it's not just a problem for a particular community or a particular demographic. It means that we are not as strong as a country as we can be. And when applied to the criminal justice system, it means we're not as effective in fighting crime as we could be. So as we come together this evening and for subsequent Thursdays through early October, we should focus on reforms that will help every person in Los Angeles feel that they are being treated fairly and equally. The forum scheduled in the next few weeks and the work of this advisory committee and the ongoing work of the commission are all in an effort to achieve that goal. And we know, we do know that we have a lot of work to do. These forums are one part of the process. These forums are designed to be listening sessions to hear ideas in the five areas that I highlighted. For that reason, we will not be asking questions this evening, although I know we will all have a lot of questions. Uh, but it is far more important tonight that we listen. And we listen to ideas on police reform. In addition to listening tonight, we have opened up an email address for those who wish to offer their ideas and suggestions. And the email address is police commission advisory committee at lapd.online. So it's police commission advisory committee, one word, at lapd.online. Trust between law enforcement agencies and the people they protect and serve is essential in a democracy. It is key to the stability of our communities, the integrity of our criminal justice system, and the safe and effective delivery of policing services. Those are not my words, but the opening paragraph of the 2015 report on the President's Task Force on 21st Century Policing, a report from over five years ago, but words that remain incredibly relevant today. And there are older reports I know that we could all cite to that also highlight the importance of building trust, addressing systemic issues, and ensuring that all members of our community feel that they can receive safe and effective policing services. It's a problem for all of us to solve and to solve together. And I do hope that tonight and throughout this series of listening sessions that it brings us closer to the goal that thus far has remained elusive to many. That is the goal of the forums and the mission of the commission and the avenues that we will begin to take in an effort to achieve those goals. Thank you to all the speakers who are joining us this evening. Thank you for presenting. When you're brought up to the screen and called up, you will have 10 minutes to speak and you can see that there is a, a clock on the, the monitor. Uh, you can use all or part of that time. However, I have to caution you, you cannot use more. At the one minute mark, I may interrupt you if I feel like you're just getting started so that you're aware that you have one minute left uh, and ask you to begin your conclusion. Um, I wanna be fair to everyone who has signed up and not just tonight's speakers, but all of the speakers throughout all of the evenings. So I ask everyone to kindly maintain the 10 minute time maximum. All speakers this evening, I do wanna warn you, it is our first forum in this particular format and inevitably we might have issues that we will learn from and improve upon. So I ask you to bear with us. With that, I'm going to start talking and focus on listening to you. Um, our first speaker tonight, uh, Madam Secretary, if you could ask Professor Jody Armour to um, uh, be um, brought to present, please. And I'd ask each speaker uh, to introduce yourself and your affiliation as well. Thank you very much, Professor. And Madam Secretary, if you can assist the professor in unmuting his microphone. 
There we All go. All right. Very good. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to talk about some of the interventions that we have been considering and how those interventions might help to at least ameliorate the problems that we're seeing um, over and over again on uh, what seem like racial injustice groundhog day uh, videos. I get up every day, every other day, and I see a similar kind of video that's uh, uh, suggesting that uh, maybe we need more of this or more of that in the way of training or technological interventions like body cameras and the like. But what we seem to have found is that all of those interventions don't really root out some of these core problems. And I have to take some responsibility for um, coming up with one of the interventions that I don't think has been very effective. Uh, unconscious bias training, implicit bias training. I started my legal scholarship career writing about information processing approaches to human cognition that delved into the cognitive unconscious back when I first started writing in the early 90s. And I was one of the first people in the li legal literature to talk about, we didn't call it implicit bias back then, we called it bias rooted in the cognitive unconscious because we were coming up with those kind of cognitive models. And I was an evangelist for uh, going around the country uh, talking about how we need to engage in implicit bias training and come to terms with our own unconscious tendencies to discriminate against people from stereotype groups. And I think many people, there was a lot of optimism at the time. I was talking to corrections officers. I was talking to police officers, uh, police unions and uh, police departments. I was talking to law enforcement of all kinds as well as everybody else I could about this, this phenomenon that we were getting a handle on. And we were very hopeful about the future. The, 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 we thought that we might be able to get a handle on this and through the right kind of training, control our unconscious cognitive reflexes. Um, I have to report that the data that I'm looking at now, the empirical research that is rolling in is saying it just isn't true. That the implicit bias training does not cash out in real changes in applied situations. All right, and it's hard for me to say that. Because, you know, I wrote so much about it. I have, you know, a lot of my early, you know, career and reputation is rooted on the validity of that. And, and so it's hard for me to swallow this, but I'm telling you, it's not what we thought it was. It's far from a silver bullet or panacea. It never really was intended to be that, but it doesn't, it's more a, it's more something that we can uh, do and think we're doing more than we're really doing. I'm not saying it's all together um, worthless. I'm just saying we shouldn't overestimate its value. Um, and so what I can, one, one part of that um, literature that I think is important and is uh, important to the recommendation I'm going to make is that we are all biased against members from stereotype groups. It's unconscious, it happens from a very early age, and we can't do a lot to control it. It's not that, uh, my, the recent studies don't say it's not there, it's just saying we can't do a lot to control it. So once we really recognize that we cannot do a lot to control these unconscious biases against members of stereotype groups, then we start to, I think, realize that the answer isn't trying to engage in better training techniques that will root out something that will not be rooted out, but rather to minimize the contacts between people from, say, law enforcement who are violence workers. By definition, their job description is they are violence workers. They arrive at a problem with a gun, a, a club, a taser, mace. They are violence workers. All right, we have to minimize the contacts between violence workers and members of stereotype groups because 
ordinary people, police are people too. And police are just like all the rest of us. We're all ordinary people. We all have these biases and unconscious biases. That means that for police officers, just like anyone else, their biases are gonna express themselves when they have interactions with members from stereotype groups. It's inevitable, it's ineluctable, it's, in, it, 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 right? it's inexorable. And so given the, the inevitability of it, what we want to do is then minimize the opportunities for bias by minimizing the contacts. And we can do that, for example, in a lot of different ways. I, I, again, this goes back to unbundling perform, um, uh, proposals. Some people prefer the language defund. Uh, that seems to uh, uh, strike a raw nerve for many people. So unbundling seems to be a more neutral way of saying the same thing. And I've heard a lot of, I'm a, I'm a board member on an, in a, of an organization called LEAP, Law Enforcement Action Partnership. And what they are, both current and former police chiefs down to rank and file folks who have said, you know, a lot of times the problems that are created between the police force and the citizens is we're given bad laws to enforce. For example, when we're given marijuana laws to enforce, that generates a reservoir of resentment between us and the community uh, that's unnecessary. And so they've, they've come in and they were strong in moving, going around the country, speaking as law enforcement in favor of marijuana legalization, recognizing that they were trying, the, the important way to start to build trust between police and the, and the community is to stop having them enforce policies that unnecessarily generate resentment between the community and police. I'll give you some other examples. There are lots of such policies, right? Um, broken windows policing. The whole philosophy, you know, we're going to crack down on the smallest thing so that, you know, because from small acorns, mighty oak trees grow. So we got to nip it in the bud, right, was the whole philosophy, again, been empirically falsified. I can go into the literature. That was, it was never really a very sound theory. It has been politically falsified in all kinds of ways. So we're unnecessarily generating, you know, um, um, tents and rancor filled interactions between police and community members that isn't even doing any good because broken windows does not pan out as a policy, right? Um, we don't have to have police responding to drug overdose cases. Um, we, should, we, should, we have other professionals that can respond to that. Um, drug problems generally, uh, when it comes to mental health, um, you know, there, there be, we can minimize the contacts, have um, um, mental health workers intervene. Um, try to, even when it comes to traffic, you know, we need to start traffic stops. You know, uh, we ha just had an incident in, in LA that all you know about in which a guy, I guess, you know, uh, a, a guy uh, was uh, in a, a violation, a code violation for his vehicle. His vehicle was his bicycle, okay? And now he's dead. So there are a lot of laws, and this is what Law Enforcement Action Partnership LEAP, I think, is very uh, 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 insightful about. There are a lot of ways we can reduce interactions, unnecessary ones, between the police and the community, and then uh, make police, uh, allow police to do what the community really wants them to do, right? Here's what the community that I know, the black community, wants as much as any community in this nation, and that is we want our violent crime solved, we want our serious crime solved. We, in some communities, you only have 20% of the rapes being solved. You have uh, sometimes 40, only 35, 40% of the homicides being solved. Those resources, instead of solving rapes, we let rape kit backlogs warehouse and pile up and don't process them because we have police resources going after broken windows policing and cracking down on homeless people in Skid Row and doing a lot of other things, going after turnstile jumpers. We don't have that problem as much in LA, but elsewhere, a lot of those resources could be going towards solving serious violent crimes, which we really want some solution of, but it takes a lot of resources to get to, to solve crimes. It takes a lot of investigative work. It takes a lot of effort, right? And so we can make ourselves safer by unbundling, minimizing the contact. We can minimize bias by minimizing the contact, give police good policies to enforce that don't unnecessarily generate re you know, resentment between them and community members. 
and have them do what the community is crying out for, help us solve these serious crimes, these murders and rapes and violent assaults, right? That's what we really want and need. And, and I think we can come together on that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. We appreciate you taking the time today to join us and to share your thoughts. Uh, very important. Thank you so much. Uh, and um, we'll uh, now say goodbye to you, sir, and, and ask the next speaker to come up. Um, and the next on my list is uh, Daryl Good, Madam Secretary. Again, thank you, Professor. And Madam Secretary, I assume everyone that I'm calling is, is actually um, here and in Hello. Show. Hello. Hi. Um, give us one second. One second, okay. Mr. Good. Um, okay. Uh, Madam Secretary, if you could reset the clock, please. Thank you so much. Uh, and you're ready to proceed, sir. Please go ahead. <clears throat> My name is Daryl Good. I'm with the Santa Monica Venice NAACP. And we have you have five branches of the NACP within the borders of LA City. And we have been in dialogue with three chiefs more, assistant chiefs and others regarding some of the concerns that we started back in February. The uniqueness of this was that all five presidents uh, came to the department to be collaborative in terms of the, whatever this re-imaging process is ultimately going to be. And one of the things that we, we feel is that uh, the police department wants us as a community to trust them, but does, it, does the police department trust the community? And what we mean by that is that <clears throat> when it comes to uh, how we want to be police, because they're in law enforcement, we don't, it's perceived, it's our feedback, that <clears throat> we're not in a position to be the professionals. And I think as the taxpayers who pay the salaries and live in the community, there should be a committed uh, hearing or listening by the department and trust. So for example, if the police department decides to use new weapons, for example, I know they're using a, a bolo. Now that's something I know they use in Argentina to catch cattle, but there's a weapon you can bear uh, experiment deploying, they're uh, not going to deploy it from my information because there was some uh, uh, circumstances where it didn't work the way it was supposed to work. If the police department would trust the community when they bring on these new technologies or new protocols for policing, they need to be aware that the community needs to be aware how they want, what kind of instruments are used against us. Uh, we have some concerns with, uh, we had an issue in Santa Monica, where Santa Monica, well, other half is in Santa Monica, which is a city, and Venice is also a part of LA. So when, on May 31st, I asked police chiefs in the city, whatever you do, we'll take care of property damage, just don't beat the hell out of people, because we don't want to go through that again in our city. On Juneteenth, we contacted uh, Commander Booker and requested the same thing in Santa Monica PD, work with us to make sure anybody coming from the area, they would alert us. The outcome was that we didn't have the violence that we witnessed between the community and LA, the rest of LA, in these two areas. I think there needs to be more time developed for crowd control if it's necessary, which means if their officers are well-trained, and I, from what I've seen, because of my experience, I'm a retired, administrator from Santa Monica College dealing with students and I spent a lot of time in Spanish but most of the officers I think you hear are not versed and feel comfortable in what they're doing so when they get scared or intimidated they resort to force and that's because I think there needs to be more training where they have more confidence we're meeting with the chief because the Community is very concerned. We we watch uh, an officer watch a uh, police officer beat the heck out of a young man in Boyle Heights, and the other officer did nothing to intervene, and he had his back toward him. 
in boxing, that would be considered rabbit punching, which is very dangerous. It could be a, a deadly blow hitting someone from behind. That's not something we want the department to see. We brought that to the department's uh, um, attention, and we really need them to really address the culture. That is, uh, the community doesn't understand. You don't know what it is to be police work. Uh, and I've heard officers say, uh, I've approached them, sometimes they mistake me for a retired law enforcement. And I identify myself as NHP. But I said, well, speak, speak freely. I'm not going to use it against them. But sometimes they feel, officers that are not African American, I spoke to, that black males are more aggressive and more hostile and use more, they curse more than anyone else. And especially in the, that South Central and White area. That presents a dangerous situation. A police chief once told me that when there is an interaction by the public and law enforcement, it's always an armed encounter, uh, which the last speaker was speaking to, because whenever you have one person armed, that at any time can go sideways, as we've noticed. We've also seen that from 68, when I was a youngster, and now here we are in 2020, we have a whole new young people, 18 to 25, being uh, mentally brutalized, where they're, you're going to have a whole new generation carrying these horrible feelings forward. The same things have been cared before, 65, 68, and on forward. So our vision in working with the chief as the NACP is to look at this and how do we get the police department to trust the community, which means when they want teachings, I can't see the, for some reason I can't see the timer, but anyway. Um, Sir, you have so about four minutes. You have about okay, four minutes. Okay, there we go, I see it now. Anyway, so those are the kind of things that we, I like to com commission and we're gonna be working with the chief and our assistant chief. These things are very crucial. when. In 92, when they invited us as a group, this goes back sometimes at uh, the parking lot at Dodger Stadium, they were going through drills with LAPD. I mean, they marched, they did a couple moves, and then they went back. The discipline is just not there to handle the community when it's a crisis situation. And with sworn officers, they need to be fed it. We need to look at those who don't belong there, you know, in terms of their mentality and how they relate to the community. And not just, and particularly those in the community that are, quote unquote, the least of, of us, that are marginalized, socioeconomic. And when we allow folks to brutalize them, it's a reflection on all of LA City. So to that end, we've, as a, the five branches, that's San Pedro, San Michael Bennett, Hollywood, Beverly Hill, Hollywood, uh, Northridge, and Los Angeles. And so we're committed to working with the department, but the, the commission has to understand that when you continue having these concerns, then it's, and we have to play protectively, when you have leadership that's been the mayor of African American, you've got city councilmen. The coloration has not impacted the culture enough in the LAPD to be responsive to the black community. So I think as commissioners, um, and I'm not, I, I, I can't say, I, I don't know what your responsibility does, because the truth I've read it, but there needs to be a lot more intervention to dissuade and, and to make it a more engaging process so that officers, once you put on that sworn, uh, that uniform, you're not swayed. And the community is just in some ways responsible because the media, the cop shows, there's a whole skewed perception of what policing should be. And I think that's where the honest 
conversation needs to take place. And I, and I appreciate Chief Moore extending um, his command staff to work to help us develop with the rest of the community. But this is a, we're at a critical time. And with gentrification and brutality, we've had over a million people exited LA City going to Palmdale, Lancaster, Riverside uh, because of socioeconomic. And when those pressures are coupled with educational or lack of educational opportunities, those are our concerns. And we don't need law enforcement being part of the program. And I'll end that on then. Um, we're also doing the same thing with LASD, uh, Sheriff's Department, and we're, we're pleased that we don't have the same issues with LAPD as we do have with LASD. So I appreciate your time and listening. And that's just want to let you know what we, where we are coming from with NADP. Thank you very thank much. You. Th thank you for coming and sharing your thoughts with us this afternoon. We truly appreciate it. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, Madam Secretary, thank you. And if we could uh, next bring up uh, Rachel Rose, I, I believe it's Lucky. Um, and I apologize if I'm mispronouncing your last name. Hello? Hi, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Um, my name is uh, Rachel Rose Lucky. Uh, good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Rachel Rose Lucky and I am the president of the Rampart Village Neighborhood Council. Uh, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that this commission, along with the leadership of LAPD, wants to have a workable relationship with the public. A relationship born out of a community partnership where peace officers and those they serve work together in making Los Angeles a safe place to prosper and grow. I do not have to go too much further out on this limb to know LAPD has heard the voices of the people marching in the streets, but it is not enough to hear these voices, but, but the need is to actually listen to them and take appropriate actions. I thank you for this opportunity today to do what I can to amplify those voices. It is time for deep systemic changes to occur in how we look at public safety and what the role of peace officers have in the communities they serve. I use the words, words peace officers deliberately. I use these words as a reminder of what I perceive to be the true mission of LAPD, to foster peace within communities. I do, not think, uh, I do not think this can be accomplished when our peace officers more resemble an occupying force in black and Hispanic neighborhoods than that of what used to be the image of beat cops of days past foot patrolling our streets. I am not saying that LAPD has not made strides in that direction. How LAPD now interacts with the LGBTQ community for the most part, is night and day compared to the days when gays were signal, signal, singled out and harassed. What I will say is that there's evidence that there is still exists a culture within the ranks of peace officers of a mentality of us versus them, especially within Black and Hispanic communities. Clearly, the way in which the department interacts with these communities is not working. Dave Grossman is a well-known law enforcement trainer who gives classes on the psychology, the psychology of killing. And I hope like heck, LAPD has never hired this guy. I have watched a couple of his tra trainings on video. He has been advocating making violence and killing a conditioned response by peace officers. He is advocating that peace officers react to situations automatically like robots to shoot first and answer questions later. He has booked 200 days out of the year, thereby demonstrating how ingrained this philosophy is within the law enforcement community nationwide. During a training of military personnel, he proclaimed at the top of his lungs to the recruits assembled, now you begin the process of orchestrating the instruments together 
in a symphony of death and destruction. Is that the kind of mentality we need our officers walking around with? Look, using deadly force on unarmed citizens is wrong. It is just plain wrong. When someone is unarmed or even worse, already in custody, they pose little risk to life. And to me, if peace officers cannot subdue and restrain an unarmed person without killing them, then there is something horribly wrong with the training officers are receiving. And when an unarmed person is killed by peace officers, who is it that holds them accountable? Who is it that holds an officer accountable when non-lethal excessive force is used? To answer that question, I did a dive into the memorandum of understanding between the city of Los Angeles and the Los Angeles Protective League, AKA the police union. What I found disturbed me. From what I can determine, what it boiled down to is that the police police themselves. The procedures in place for dealing with grievances from the public starts with an intake process by somebody on the force, although a complaint can be filed with your commission, the police commission instead. But even still, the complaint ends up back at the department. Then the complaint goes to uh, the internal affairs group, again, made up of police officers for investigation, or the complaint can go to mediation facilitated by an LAPD supervisor who, from what I can tell, is also a peace officer. The final decision as to the dispensation of, of, grievance, of grievances ultimately seems to be made by the chief of police. It is no secret there is an unwritten rule within the ranks of peace officers of protect your own, or at least there is a public impression this is true. And I have heard it said that there are a lot, a lot more good cops than bad ones. But here's the thing I keep coming back to as I contemplate all of this. Bad cops have traditionally not been held accountable, at least not to the level the public demands. In most instances, they remain on the force. When there are allegations of non-lethal non -lethal excessive uses of force, little repercussion seems to happen to those officers. Some officers rack up a disturbing record of abuses of power, and the public is prevented from reviewing those personnel records. It is a peace officer's records where, if the police, if the peace officer's records were made available to the public in terms of grievances filed and their discrepancy, uh, dispensations, the public would be able to voice their objections, thereby adding a layer of accountability. When good cops do not speak up against bad cops, then they are no longer good cops. The, the, the job of peace officers is to bring to justice anyone who violates the law, and that includes other officers they serve with. Right now, many in the, pub, in the public perceive the entire department to be opaque and therefore untrustworthy. This in turn creates further animosity by the public towards peace officers. A vicious cycle is created. And when the good cops do not step up and call out the bad cops, cops for whatever reason, be it fear of retribution from fellow cops or, or what have you, then these cops are no longer good cops. Additionally, the very folks who are in charge of adjudicating the wrongdoings of police officers have a symbiotic relationship with the department. I am of course referring to district attorneys. District attorneys work hand in hand with the officers day in and day out. It is my belief they have little appetite for bringing criminal charges against the very people they rely on to, the in, to do the investigations for their cases. My recommendations are as follows. One, a paradigm shift in how peace officers view the public must happen. We can no longer afford to have officers regard the public as enemy, enemy combatants. There needs to be independent psychological evaluations at least once a year on all officers at every level 
to, to identify those who hold biases that could lead to violent outcomes while out on patrol or for those in higher positions of authority who might be allowing this mentality to continue to exist. Number two, the adjudication process of grievances by the public needs to be taken out of the hands of the department and placed into the hands of impartial of an impartial panel of citizens, much like the way a grand jury is put together. Number three, any judicial proceedings forwarded by a panel are to be brought to DAs outside of the County of Los Angeles, similar to the way requests for a change of venue are handled. Number four, a public rating system of officers, possibly similar to Yelp, where the public can uh, post observations about officers and where they can see overall ratings data. Number five, grievance data on officers need to be available to the public. To yeah, summarize, about 30 seconds, thank you. To summarize, the police should not be policing themselves. Prosecutors should not be from LA. Transparency through open performance reviews of complaints must be made available to the public and mental evaluations need to be performed annually. Until these items are put into place, in my mind, the public will continue to be untrusting of our local law enforcement. Thank you very much. We greatly appreciate you taking the time this afternoon to join us with your ideas and your thoroughness. Thank you for your recommendations. Um, and we'll call up our, our next speaker, uh, Dr. Mejan, I believe. I might be, again, mispronouncing the name and I apologize. I guess we're uh, not going, we're going to Mr. Sherwin. And uh, I believe he's co-presenting with Ms. Viola. If you could bring Ms. Viola as well. There we go. Thank you. Hi, I'm Gina Viola. And my name is Zach Sherwin. Zach and I are members of White People for Black Lives, a white anti-racist collective based here in Los Angeles. Despite the fact that we're presenting at this meeting, we don't want our participation to be misconstrued. We do not acknowledge the legitimacy of this so-called community forum. We reject everything about it. This meeting is a sham and a travesty. To begin with, calling this a quote unquote community forum is a misnomer. To the contrary, only invitees are able to speak here today. And sure, anybody can watch, but there's no public comment period. So the community has been silenced yet again. And by again, I mean that since the June 2nd meeting of the Board of Police Commissioners, this commission has repeatedly acted to further limit the general public's opportunities to speak, which are honestly pretty meager to begin with. Commissioner Decker, you've mentioned forums like this one when you defend cutting speakers' time at the Tuesday meetings. How can this compensate when the public cannot speak to you at a purported listening session? You've also provided the option to submit comment via email but email is an unsatisfactory medium for people to share their experiences when their family members have been killed by LAPD or when they've experienced the trauma of being unhoused in Los Angeles. The suggestion to email comments about these experiences is an insult compounded by the fact that emailed comments are not published online, either as part of the commission's agenda or in any other public record. Also, you barely publicize this event. There was no mention of it at the commission's meeting this past Tuesday. As of 4 p.m. yesterday, it wasn't even listed on your website. Your outreach efforts were woefully inadequate. We also denounced this advisory committee on building trust and equity, which is yet another pretext for Mayor Garcetti to expand the size and scope of the LAPD. We've seen time and again what supposed oversight and reform of the LAPD looks like. After the Watts Rebellion, there was the McCone Commission. After the Rodney King uprising, there was the Christopher Commission, the staff of which included Commissioner Bonner. After the Rampart scandal, the city entered a consent decree imposed by the Department of Justice, which incidentally was opposed by the longest serving appointee to the police commission, current commissioner, Steve Soboroff. So much lip service to reform and oversight. This commission is just one more example of it, but none of it prevented the brutality faced in recent months by protesters of racist policing. None of it prevents the ongoing murders of black and brown people like Rosario Mack, Waukesha Wilson, Charlie Africa, Jesse Romero, Ezel Ford, 
Riddell Jones, Eric Rivera, Daniel Hernandez, Melly Corrado, and literally hundreds more. White People for Black Lives stands in solidarity with Black Lives Matter Los Angeles, Stop LAPD Spying Coalition, and the Los Angeles Community Action Network. Accordingly, we show up to every commission meeting in order to amplify their messages. And because we know that far too often, white people are the ones who are calling the police on black, brown, and poor people. Programs like Suspicious Activity Reporting, or SARS, and I Watch or See Something, Say Something, which encourage community members and officers to presume guilt and criminality have a disparate impact on black, brown, and poor communities. It's too easy for white people to overlook the consequences of calling the police because statistically, we are overwhelmingly less likely to bear the brunt of policing's most harmful and racist outcomes. This brings us to a key point. The people most impacted and harmed by police violence have not been invited to speak here today. We'd now like to read the words of some of the people who would be presenting and testifying if they had been invited. The following was written by Albert Corrado. My sister Melly was killed by LAPD in July of 2018. Two officers fired into a crowded grocery store and their actions were deemed in policy by this commission. How can this body claim to want to work with the community when they allow officers who commit heinous acts to walk the streets? How does clearing officers of any wrongdoing build trust in communities? In the two years since my sister was killed, my family has never once been asked to speak at a police commission hearing. Melly has never once been acknowledged by this commission and people like Chief Moore and Steve Soboroff have done nothing but side with officers and by doing so have eroded what little trust may have existed between marginalized communities and law enforcement. It's a shame that this commission is tasked with holding officers, account holding officers accountable because it has failed to do so at every turn. The only community you serve is law enforcement and their boosters. I hope you all burn in hell and I am going to end all of your careers. Sincerely, Albert J. Corrado. A letter from the Hernandez family was written by Daniel's sister, Marina Vergara. Our family is dismayed at the lack of support from the Los Angeles Police Commission. We've tried to participate in the meetings, but we do not feel that we are listened to as participants. The Police Commission rubber stamps all the recommendation items made by the LA Police Chief. The board needs to value the community input if they are re to represent the citizens of LA. Our brother, Daniel Hernandez, was executed by Los Angeles Police Department Officer Tony McBride on April 22, 2020. My brother was in a multi-vehicle accident collision. He required aid as a result of the collision, but instead he was shot two times, fell to the ground, and then shot five more times. Two of those shots were to the head and back. The LAPD officer made no attempt to de-escalate the situation. Even after that, no officer approached Danny to check on him for almost two minutes. Officer McBride was the only officer to fire her weapon, while other more seasoned officers around her did not. As a Mexican immigrant family, we have suffered police brutality at the hands of the Los Angeles Police Department. Where does a family turn when a family member is killed at the hands of law enforcement? I never imagined this could happen to us, a family made up of law-abiding citizens. I was forced to take a leading role to advocate and be the voice for my family, for if I did not, who would? It became my mission to not only call out the tactics of the Los Angeles Police Department, but to also help the victims find support after reprehensible acts like that which occurred against my brother and many other poor souls that happened to be in front of an officer at the wrong time, even if doing nothing wrong. We need you to listen to the families of those who've been lost at the hands of law enforcement. You must invite us to the table. We demand a seat. We have a voice. The following was written by Valerie Rivera. Hi. I am Valerie, the mother of Eric Rivera, who was shot, killed, and run over with a police vehicle because your negligent officer failed to put his car in park when he jumped out. I'm still seeking justice and accountability for my son, who did not deserve to die and did not deserve what your officers did to him. I'm curious to know why the commission board never reaches out to any families that are out here who have been extremely impacted by your officers and department. You sit here always talking about wanting to speak to community members, but never want to speak to me or any family. We families have a lot to say about how you all are handling and disciplining your officers and the training or lack of training, I should say. But instead you continue to wanna portray yourselves as if you all are doing a job well done. 
If you all want to make real change, then you all should just quit your jobs because you have done nothing but protect and serve yourselves while our black and brown lives are still being stolen by your department. Shame on all of you. Justice for Eric Rivera, no justice, no peace. In closing, we would like to lift up some of Black Lives Matter Los Angeles previous demands of the police commission, which include disbanding the LAPD Metro Division immediately, dismantling mass surveillance, firing Chief Moore, requesting that State Attorney General Javier Becerra launch an immediate independent investigation into the LAPD, and lastly, BLMLA demands that the mayor establish and fund a reparations unit in South LA that begins to remedy the individual and community-wide harm that comes as a result of the demonstrated racism, corruption, and abuse by the LAPD. Thank you for listening. And to members of the public who might be listening, especially white people, we ask you to think critically about the definition of public safety and what it is that actually keeps our families safe. Is it a militarized response to poverty and to mental health crises? Or does true public safety come from access to affordable housing, access to jobs, access to healthy food, access to health care? We cannot truly believe that continuing to aim reforms at an institution that does not provide families with these things will keep our communities safe. There is a better way forward for Los Angeles. And finally, the citizens whose voice you are supposed to be in police affairs have no faith that these meetings, like the forum that we're at right now, will bring meaningful change. This proceeding is a sham. Shame on you. That concludes our remarks. Thank you very much. We do appreciate both of you attending this afternoon. We understand that you take great issue with a lot that happens in the commission, and we do believe your voices are equally important to everyone else's. Thank you for taking the time. We'll next call up our next speaker, please. Um, Madam Secretary, Dr. Mejan, I believe is here as well. And I apologize, uh, doctor, if I gave you the false impression you were going uh, previously. So I apologize for that, uh, but uh, doctor? That happens, don't <laughs> worry. <laughs> well, Good afternoon, thank you, thank you. I'm so happy to know that I'm on because I was very distressed that I thought that I had been here since 3.50 and I wasn't able to speak. Um, so I'm Dr. Aliyah Mahone. And I wanna start by saying that it's my personal belief that we can't be enemies. That in order for us to actually heal and to take care of what is not working for us, Sergeant Luke is calling me to find out if I'm here, uh, that we have to recognize that working together is really the golden key. So I'm a long time diversity trainer. I started in 1995. I've done many programs with the LAPD, including in 2016, probably the most significant and notable one was that I brought Laura King, Rodney King's daughter, to reconcile through the Community Relationship Division, and at that time, Captain Ruby Flores. And um, I have done many programs over the years with young people in schools around law enforcement and police. And I also serve at the Museum of Tolerance. I work with the educators and I'm associated with the law, the law enforcement training program there meaning that I know who the people are. I don't work in that particular department. I work with teachers and administrators. I am very versed and extremely much an advocate for truth and reconciliation and restorative practices. Restorative justice is something that I teach to teachers and that I use on students or with students in regards to, I would say an option to punitive measures. And I submitted a proposal in 2017 after working with Laura, uh, Laura King and the police department that I'm gonna read a little bit of right now. But, but I wanna say that the energy that was just brought by Black Lives Matter is welcome. But I would invite Black Lives Matter, if you can hear me, I would challenge you to actually come in peace and to think about what it would be like 
if when you made the accusations that you just made, if you were ready to also step in and do the work. The other thing that I'm also very much about is that if we want solutions, we have to be willing to bring them ourselves and not look to others to bring those solutions. So let me just read from you. I actually prepared a PowerPoint. I wasn't sure about the format of this meeting. So I'm proposing a citizen police trust building project that's based on truth and reconciliation. And that project would determine a clear framework and jointly design between law enforcement and citizens a specific set of methodologies. We would test those methodologies and find out the ones that are most effective or the ones that work best in different environments. I'm asking that our biggest focus be cultivating authentic relationship, meaning that we do have to come in peace and we do have to come from the place of, please join me in addressing this thing that's afflicting our lives because we are all being impacted negatively about this. And just so you know, so that those who may be listening to me, especially the folks that I just called out from Black Lives Matter, I am a mother who lost her only child at the age of 24, which was 26 years ago. My son was not shot by a police officer, he committed suicide, but his feeling was that at any moment he could die. And all of his peers felt the same way. I'm from Detroit, Michigan, not LA. And the circumstances of our lives in the inner city in Detroit were very much like the inner city or urban conditions here in Los Angeles. I have lived in Los Angeles since 1997. And I have come always from a place of, I want to be the change that I want to see in the world. So I'm proposing that we have citizen police partnerships, pairings of citizens with police officers, whatever rank and file level they're at, in either two party, two people situations. I used to do this with young people and adults or in small pods, but there needs to be diversity in coming from both factions, shall we just call them. I am also asking for intergenerational participation. I want the ideas of young people, Generation Z, millennials, and everybody who has already the chip inside of them, that they're the ones to be responsible for making the change. I would also like to say that we're gonna be pioneering the process. We've never done this before. So we have to understand that there's gonna be some trial and some error. But in order for us to build trust, we have to see ourselves as future builders working together. The other thing that I would share is that the way that the work will be done is that we have to start by identifying the specific goals of the project. We have to think about that together. Not me, not me outlining it, although I can certainly help you with the start of that foundation. We have to think about what we want to do and then try it out. There has to be pilots so that we can see what is the best way to go about this. I'm proposing a brain trust, which is made up of planning sessions so that there's equal footing so that everybody who wants to be a stakeholder can show up as such and they are allowed to contribute. But when they contribute something, they're also responsible for being a part of bringing it forward. I'm also proposing that there be three different formats that we do some things, well, we can't do them anymore because of the pandemic, but that we do some things virtually, that we do some things in person, that we do some things in schools, that we do some things in community centers, that we do some things in faith-based organizations, so on and so forth. We're gonna try a lot of things out in my proposal. The guiding vision of that proposal is that we are seeking to listen to each other with new ears and to learn to trust each other in ways that have not yet been explored. We're going to, I'm repeating this again so that I can be redundant because I want to be. We have to take responsibility for creating these solutions, each of us, 
because we are all afflicted by police involved violence. We are all afflicted by mistrust. We are all afflicted by whatever the breakdowns in the relationships are that have given rise to what we have to face and see on the news far too often. We need to not only do this, but harvest those ideas so that we can share the best practices and continue to evolve them over time. So my last statement is that truth and reconciliation is about knowing that there's been a wrong, knowing that things have been negative, dark, hurtful, harmful, deadly, whatever the words may be, and to say, this is the truth of our circumstances. We're going to start from that truth, and we're going to build to where we really want to go. I'm going to forgive you once you tell the truth so that I can work with you as my partner and collaborative associate. And we are going to collectively take responsibility for making things better and safer for us all. I also want to mention that I happen to know that police officers are also harmed and killed because of the circumstances of the situation that we're faced with. It's not just citizens, and yes, there are some citizens, and there's definitely senseless violence, and there's way too much death, but police officers are also being threatened, and I want that to be registered as a part of this conversation. So I don't know what else I can say other than um, I am here if you need me. I am happy to plan with others. I have actually submitted this proposal in a long format three years ago to some folks then who I was collaborating with, somebody now who you know is the police chief of San Francisco. He was deputy, uh, he was deputy chief of police, Bill, Bill or William Scott was one of my partners back in the day. Uh, Ruby, whose last name is now Flores again, she's commander, is also somebody who knows me well. I am not a stranger to the LAPD. So thank you very much for allowing me to be here. And I would just like to sit in silence for the next five seconds so that we can reset and remember that we're a team. Thank you very much, Doctor. We appreciate you taking your time this afternoon to join us um, and to share your thoughts on these very important matters. Uh, thank you for stopping by today. Absolutely. We, uh, Madam Secretary, um, can you um, determine whether Reverend Anderson is in queue? Um, I believe um, the Reverend um, had a time commitment and wanted to speak at a certain time. If you could find out if Reverend Anderson is in queue, if not, we'll go on. Oh. Yes, he is here. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Reverend Anderson, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me here. Um, first, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Reverend Eddie Anderson. I'm the senior pastor at McCarty Memorial Christian Church. I'm the regional organizer uh, for LA Voice, which organizes over 55 uh, congregations. I'm for pleasure for, for Black Lives. And I've been a community advocate with uh, Black Lives Matter uh, LA for a couple of years as well. And I've been part of the police commission for a couple of years as well. I'm glad to be able to speak before the advisory group. However, I would like to say that I'm uh, highly disappointed with the method used by the mayor to allow citizen participation. Uh, the mayor and his advisor decided that this forum advertised in the press release at a citywide community meetings to solicit feedback and ideas for a forum would be by invitation only. Uh, he and his people would invite only select members of the city to participate. And the method of selectivity admitted those members of the city most harmed by LAPD and police procedures. I had to request an invitation to be here. I had to invite myself. BLMLA uh, told me that this meeting was happening. and I uh, had to invite myself to come to share some ideas with you. The reason I wanted to share my ideas is because uh, I've been working with LA Voice in Pico, California around a program called HEAT. Uh, I, I started Trust Talks LA a couple of years ago as well. And I really uh, am concerned uh, because we keep on talking about uh, training and transparency, but when we were around the entire state uh, training police officers, 
We've been around the, the, a couple of years ago, three or four years ago. Uh, we even had um, a colleague of mine go and try uh, to train uh, uh, police officers in the LAPD. Here's what I heard. And this is why I believe that this process needs to involve the community and those who are impacted. Uh, a police officer, a part of LAPD, uh, told me these conversations are good, Reverend, uh, but what real training happens with beat officers. And when we meet with beat officers and we try to tell beat officers about racial implicit bias and we try to tell beat officers around how they are harming the community and how we try to tell police officers that the badge that they wear carries with it the legacy of slave catching, uh, they totally rejected that. So they didn't realize that it was causing more harm than not, that the community uh, was really uh, being harmed and that racial policing and bias is happening in our community, but there are alternatives that does not involve uh, the police. That training we've tried over and over again and in this moment uh, where we are at a third reconstruction in our nation, a third reconstruction where the entire world is opened up, uh, that we can do better and that the LAPD uh, it has been complicit in causing that harm and danger. I know we want to build trust in our community, but you can't build trust if you stop first earning uh, trust and the trust is totally lost with LAPD. What you hear, see the community saying is we want safety and that's not police. That safety is creating programming uh, for uh, the community and the Metro division has been one of the greatest uh, perpetuators of harm in our community. I'm also part of the Push LA Coalition and we've been asking and demanding for a couple of years that you stop the stops. You saw in the front cover of the LA Times today that uh, you have to go back and go look at cases and DA trying to dismiss cases because we saw that those pretextual stops are racist stops. And we know those stops are racist. LA Times has shown us that. We see it right now in the, in the LA Times, at the front page of the LA Times just today as well. And so we are demanding and we're really asking that you will stop the stops because community is continuing to be hard. That you would disband the Metro Division. Uh, when we talk about Metro Division, my members who, my church has been in this community for over 90 years. Uh, so my members talk about when they heard Metro, they heard crash. Okay, they heard about and they remembered the pain inflicted upon our community and you can't build trust and trust I don't think is, is the goal here. Um, but you can't even build anything like that because that is what it perpetuates. When I drive down the street in South LA and I live in South LA and I have constant surveillance of my home. Me and my wife moved to Jefferson Park right down the street from my church in West Adams. And every morning I'm woken up by helicopters Every night I go to bed to police helicopters. There's no trust, right? It's really more like uh, hard influence. And so we really need uh, the commission to really step up um, in, this, in this moment of reconstruction and to lead the bold leadership, uh, to lead in the way that scripture says that allows everyone to have their own tree in their own shade under their own tree, right? And to realize that safety it's not just the absence of police, but it's also the presence of resources and that we can have different ways of moving in our spaces uh, today. There's so many people who have died at the hands of police at these pretextual stops. And I really, just really wanted to impress upon us in this moment, um, especially coming off of the young man in uh, South LA, my church secretary, she was friends with the young man who was on his bike and got pulled pulled over by the uh, sheriff's department, which LAPD uses the same kind of pretextual racist uh, based of policing and killed uh, a young man. These things should not happen. And uh, I, me doing training and seeing this happen across uh, the state, I know uh, that there has to be a better way, that there has to be uh, community-based solutions uh, given from the community given from uh, interventionalists. I've worked with uh, great workers, uh, a colleague of mine hosts Second second Call. Uh, and so one of the first things we can do is stop the stops in our community, really sh give a nod, right? When Chief Moore uh, was elected, he had a conversation with LA Voice. Uh, and we told him in that meeting before he was even sworn in uh, that he has to realize that for the black community, 
that badge often carries harm, right? And what you needed to do then was an apology. Well, now an apology is no longer uh, needed because we've seen across the nation that we are right-sizing um, police departments by shifting budgets, that like we are reinvesting in the community and that the real way I think to show faith in the community is to stop the stop and reinvest in services that are based in the community uh, to make sure folks know uh, what is going on. That is what uh, makes us safe. I have too many of my uh, parishioners who are in their 90s who call me and they say to me, uh, Pastor, why are you all fighting the same fight that I fought when I was your age? Now think about that. Their age, when they were my age, and I'm 30 years old, their age was 1950s and 60s. And they lived in LA. And they still had the same harm that I'm feeling now from the LAPD. And so the question that we really have to have is what does bold leadership look like at this moment? I know as commissioners, uh, you all have that. Uh, I'm thankful for BLM LA and the way they kept on showing up at this commission for letting me know that this meeting is happening, for giving you alternatives uh, to public safety and showing you how we can fund uh, services to bring the families who have the pain, who have to endure uh, losing. I have a member of my church who runs the victim services uh, unit for the county and she talks about the pain and I see the pain with the families of, uh, on the street with Black Lives Matter Los Angeles as well. And so I think we have to take that pain seriously and really get, uh, not play politics in this moment, but really lead with moral courage and move from moral agents to moral leaders to really give a community what they deserve. Uh, and with that, uh, I yield my time and I thank you uh, for having me here. And I hope you will listen to the community voice and invite them more in this process. Thank you, Reverend, for coming. We truly appreciate it and appreciate your, your thoughtful uh, suggestions for us. Uh, thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, we do appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening. Um, our next uh, speaker, I believe, is uh, Dr. Stephen Webb. Uh, Madam Secretary, if you could bring Dr. Webb. Good afternoon, Dr. Webb. Are you able to hear me? Yes, now we can hear you, sir. How are you? We're well. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you for having us here. Uh, Dr. Stephen Webb is my name. I represent a uh, group of individuals uh, called Advocates of the San Fernando Valley. We are grassroots community-based active stakeholders uh, in the Valley area, made up of business owners, homeowners, students, uh, television personalities, otherwise voters, uh, connected with a unifying interest in ensuring that urban communities with a predominant amount of people of color are represented in a uni uh, unifying fashion. I kind of want to start out with the definition of reform. Reform means the improvement or amendment of what is wrong, corrupt, unsatisfactory. Um, the verb usage of reform to make changes in something typically a social, political, or economic institution or practice in order to improve it. Uh, so let me just get to the, the, the meat of the discussion in terms of reform. First of all, an official statement by the city, county, or LAPD acknowledging that racially specific and predatory policing exists in our society and that there is a true commitment to eradicate it. Without acceptance of this problem, there is no solution. Uh, individuals that have actually uh, had issues with LAPD need to hear from LAPD. We've had, we, we acknowledge our issues uh, and we want to work with you, the community, to resolve them. And I apologize about the video delay. Uh, number two, hire more mental health professionals as frontline responders and supervisors. That is very important. I wake up this morning. I Turn on KTLA and I see a summary. Daniel Prude, Rochester, New York, clearly had mental health issues. The officer response at that time, they put a spit mask on this, on this young man, held him down on the ground for two minutes, 
and he died of asphyxiation. Clearly, if there were mental health therapists or uh, professionals there, they could have de-escalated that situation. This young man would still be alive. Very important. Uh, number three, implement a more robust system for officer psychological vetting and support, starting from the pre-hiring process. An example of that would, that would be to have black therapists, psychiatrists, psychologists in the pre-hiring stage, giving uh, the pre-hire examples of uh, people of color issues and how they are going to deal with those issues. So you can get into the psyche of these officers before they are on the street. You don't want to couple a mental health issue and this is your first experience of dealing with someone of color, you're going to rely on your police training, not on any type of mental health training. That is very important. Uh, most often than not, when a lot of these officers that are uh, confronted with a person of color, that could be their very first instant of interacting with someone from color, of color. Say, for example, if you live in Apple Valley and there's not a large uh, population of African-Americans there and you come on the force and you're patrolling South Los Angeles, Compton, and you're dealing with an influx of our people, uh, if you don't know the culture, if you don't know the dynamics, you're going to focus on your police training and not people, human beings as a whole. Number four, vastly improve officer training to prioritize de-escalation techniques. Not every call uh, needs to be responded to with violence. Sometimes you can de-escalate a situation just by trying to figure out verbally what's going on. It doesn't always have to be react first in a violent manner. And historically speaking, that is what's always happened. I, I kind of want to leapfrog from number four. For a suggestion for this committee. If you want people of color in urban communities and, and, and name any of the Southland to, to have credibility for this commission here, have people on this commission that look like the people that you're trying to develop that parity with. So that there's that, that unifying effort. This is a collaboration. I would, if I live in the community, I would like to come to this commission and see people that look like me, that can rep that understand what I'm going through, my needs, my educational downfall, my financial downfall, and not telling me what they think is good for me and not knowing my community. Uh, number five, the establishment of a uh, citizens review, review board with subpoena powers to address repeat offenders taking that away from any other commission that has to deal with the police, let that be dealt with the citizens directly. Uh, number six, create and maintain a national database of officers with repeated and confirmed problems with excessive force, searchable by every municipality and citizens review board. Very important. If I'm in New York and I was terminated or I, resigned, I retired from the force there in New York, and I had a history of excessive force, but yet I come to, but I was highly decorated. I moved to Los Angeles. Los Angeles is going to see me as a highly decorated officer, not with my issues. So we want to be able to make sure that there's a correlation wherever an officer goes, your history is going to follow you. And then at that point, for example, if LAPD decides to hire that officer, knowing that that person has that type of excessive history, that's on LAPD. If there was a national database that had that information, that would be very crucial to having any officer transfer from one location to the next. Uh, require that, uh, this is number seven, require that officers carry their own professional liability insurance, much like doctors. Yes, it is out of the box. However, what I want you to consider is this. Doctors carry malpractice insurance. Doctors save lives. Officers, unfortunately, have that power to take lives. 
if the arc of justice for people of color continues to bend or formulate like a pretzel, as it has been historically for African Americans, perhaps if officers that are on duty realize that financially they could be uh, uh, suffer a financial ruin should justice not swing uh, our way because of their doing. Maybe they'll think twice about actions they do on the street versus what they do now. Uh, number eight, develop a community police commission ensuring community-based attorneys are on board to a community oversight for the police commission. The ideology behind that is very simple. If a police commission is supposed to oversight or oversee the police, and if there's police on the com police commission, how can it be transparent? There needs to be another group of individuals that oversee it all to make sure there's parity, transparency, et cetera. A uh, couple other things, because I know my time is running short, should be mandated during the hiring process that rookies live in a community for a period of time uh, uh, as they're hired. Perhaps mandate two years. If you're going to patrol in the South Central Los Angeles area, live in that area. Get to know that, that community. I'm originally from Baltimore. And as one of the previous speakers indicated, one thing that's missing is beat cops. Beat cops walk the street. They knew their neighborhoods. They knew individuals. If an officer is mandated to live there, and perhaps the commission can come up with a housing subsidy or something like that to help them have a house or get a house. Uh, that gets them to not only know the community, but know this culture, because there's more behind that black face that they see. Not every black face that they see is a threat. That's very important. You can't serve the community unless you know that community. Uh, actually, those are all the points that I, I, I want to cover. Uh, I don't want to take a, a lot of time. Again, I do appreciate you allowing me to speak on behalf of our group. And, and keep in mind, we are readily available. Uh, and, and we, uh, we um, have a very nice sized group. So we're readily av available for coalition building, for unification, because I think that I can speak for you all as well too. The, the, the way that we are going in terms of the interaction between police and the African-American community, we're tired. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Webb. Uh, we greatly appreciate you coming this evening and taking the time for providing such thoughtful comments and ideas and suggestions. Thank you so much. Have a good evening, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, and Madam Secretary, I, I can't uh, see if the uh, next speakers are online, but Kyler Franklin is on the list. Madam President, that speaker is not here at this moment. Oh, okay. Very, very good. Um, Jasmine Creighton? Uh, also not here. Okay, very good. Um, let me see if I can uh, find out who who is present. I know some people had some time restrictions uh, that we were trying to honor. Uh, uh, Jessica Kellogg? Yes, she's here. Uh, Ms. Kellogg, are you on the line? You may have to unmute yourself. Yes, I am here. Hi, good evening. Good evening. My name is Jessica Kellogg and I'm a Los Angeles native as well as a city employee. And I will talk about the, well, my suggested revision to the Board of Rights um, as it will be coming up in 2021. In 2017, Angelinos approved a plan that sought to enhance discipline and accountability within LAPD with the passage of Charter Amendment C. What was considered a controversial ballot initiative allowed for the Los Angeles City Council to approve Measure C in April 2019, giving civilians a greater role in how police officers are disciplined for serious misconduct. Officers facing discipline now have the option of having their cases heard by an all civilian panel, one of the most significant expansions of civilian oversight in decades. In May 2019,
the police commission revised the qualifications for Board of Rights hearing examiners and set a recruitment plan in motion, all of which will be up for review in 2021. Looking ahead, I will discuss how we can build upon the current discipline and accountability system as we strengthen the chief of police's authority and the public's oversight of policing in Los Angeles. In order to increase accountability between the police agency and the public, public perception must be addressed. The, the chief of police is seen as having the authority to exercise discipline as necessary. Chief Moore, for example, touts that he strives to promote a community policing style of leadership that stresses intelligent partner partnership oriented strategies involving community stakeholders as well as various members of the criminal justice system. The chief of police is the highest ranking officer in the police department. As general manager of the police department, the chief is responsible for the planning, efficient administration and operation of the police department under the authority of the board of police commissioners. The recent revisions to the Board of Rights as an alternative to the Chief's discipline provides officers facing discipline with the option of picking an all civilian panel or using uh, the status quo of one civilian and two LAPD command staff members ranked captain or above. In July of 2020, following the protest for racial justice, Chief Moore said he was frustrated that the public perceives him as having ultimate authority to discipline or terminate an officer. But the chief can only recommend the most serious punishment to an administrative trial board, which has the final say. People are in their right to hold the chief of police accountable and because the office does not have the authority to do so, this is an opportunity for reform. Changing these rules would require a change to, to the city's charter, which set up the LAPD's administrative trials for officers known as boards of rights, where a three person panel weighs evidence and decides on punishment up to termination. A board can reduce the recommendation of the chief, but cannot make penalties more severe. Officers can appeal a board decision through a legal challenge in superior court. Within the last year, Moore reportedly sent 26 officers to boards of rights with recommendations that they be terminated, but in nine cases, even after the board found that the officer was guilty of misconduct, it reduced the penalty and allowed the officers to keep their jobs. In this instance, the chief of police has no ability to do anything else to that officer, but to allow him or her to remain with the workforce, restricted to assignments that have limited interaction with the public and little chance of leading to courtroom testimony. Boards of rights are often multi-day trial-like hearings in which the panel members listen to witnesses, consider evidence, and sometimes hear from an accused officer directly. Almost all of the proceedings are kept confidential and the names of the accused officers are rarely made public although an officer can request that his or her hearing is open to the public. I propose that the chief of police and citizens be given maximum power to hire and fire officers with the chief of police first providing recommendations for punishment or termination and the option of the officer resorting to a board of rights comprised of civilians who are supported by an advisory board made up of subject matter experts including a representative from the city attorney's office, a commanding officer, and a specialist in human resources, personnel, or labor relations. These civilians would be defined as City of Los Angeles residents who are community leaders, stakeholders, research analysts, scholars, advocates, et cetera. Board of Rights hearing examiners should be community members who have a track record of community engagement and are proven action oriented representatives of the greater Los Angeles community. The integrity of the discipline system cannot be undermined by civilian hearing examiners as they are currently defined. Sir Robert Peel is noted for saying, the police are the public and the public are the police. It is imperative when looking towards 2021 
that the police, the policy revolving around Measure C and the Board of Rights enhance civic engagement and accountability. The minimum qualifications for civilian hearing examiners as they stand seem fair and just. However, despite the general presumption that increased civilian participation in LAPD discipline would lead to greater accountability, even before this suggestion was adopted, there was already skepticism that this would be the result. Currently, the discipline is not likely to be as strong. The irony of civilian review is that it gives people the opposite of what most people would expect. This critique is upheld by the types of people who are examiners. They are often industry oriented and loosely related to the realm of policing as if it is their role to support the evasion of appropriate officer discipline. Additionally, the apparent leniency of civilian members on the current board may also be a product of the way in which these members were selected and the industries they represent in their professional lives. There is also some evidence that civilian hearing examiners may be removed if they do not routinely vote in favor of officers, which would further explain the apparent leniency of the existing panel members. Voting panel patterns nonetheless illustrate that civilian participation is not the universal cure expected by some advocates and depending on its execution may facilitate rather than rectify leniency by the Board of Rights. The lack of transparency around the Board of Rights has been viewed as a major factor contributing to both the, the public and officers distrust of and at times outrage at LAPD discipline. As the Inspector General recognized in its review of best practices, it is necessary to have transparency in decision making, indicating that rules are applied consistently and fairly. To ensure that the public and officers alike respect and trust the outcomes of the disciplinary system. This transparency does not exist around the Board of Rights. Board of Rights proceedings, while previously open to the public, have been closed since 2006, when the Supreme Court held in Copley Press overcoming LAPD's flawed disciplinary process versus the Superior, Superior Court that record that record, sorry, that records of officers' disciplinary proceedings were confidential under California's penal code. Although the Copley decision did not expressly hold that disciplinary hearings must be closed, the LAPD and city attorney have interpreted the ruling to require closure of Board of Rights proceedings. There have been statewide legislative attempts to reopen these proceedings, including those supported by current and former LAPD chiefs, current and former Los Angeles mayors, and the Los Angeles City Council. Los Angeles public officials have cited secrecy around the Board of Rights as a hurdle that prevents the public from seeing whether and how cops who violate policy are held accountable. Data continuously shows that the Board of Rights is a major impediment to serious discipline. If there is any legitimate reason for the board to reduce or eliminate penalties that the department, police commission, and the public think are justified, this explanation is never made public and the lack of transparency makes it impossible for the public to understand and trust the board's rationale for leniency. A significant change to current policy is to give the board the authority to not only reduce the recommendation of the chief, but make penalties more severe. Civilian representatives advised by a board of subject matter experts will couple just seeking- Jessica, your 10 minutes ha has um, concluded. Okay. Can you just wrap up? Yes. Sorry, thank you. So, well, thank you so much for coming this evening, Jessica. We, we certainly do appreciate it. Uh, you've been very uh, generous with your time in, in waiting as well as uh, in your presentation. So thank you so much for, for, for coming. And if there's any further you'd like to provide, please just um, uh, submit it to the um, email online. Um, I understand, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that we are trying to, a couple of our, our speakers are 
uh, perhaps having difficulty getting online and we're trying to correct that now, uh, why don't we take a short recess to see if we can correct that problem and get them online. Thank you very much. We'll be back shortly.
So good evening. Uh, we are still in the process of working through getting uh, a number of, of people in the session. And, uh, but I believe, Madam Secretary, that we have um, at least one of our scheduled speakers, Ms. Pettit, is that right? Yes, that's correct. Um, why don't we uh, move to her as we try to work on some of the um, other issues we're having. Okay. Thank you. Hi, good evening. Hi, Ms. Pettit. Hi there. Hi, Hi. thank you for joining us tonight. We appreciate it. Um, I think you, you're aware of the, uh, the ground rules. We have 10 minutes on the clock and we welcome all of your comments and your, your input this evening. Thank you for coming and spending some of your time tonight with us. Absolutely, and thank you so much for having me. So, um, you know, I don't know very much about what the nature of our conversation is, um, but I do believe um, it's just, um, trying to turn my phone off um, and it's not um, letting me um okay sorry about that, that this thing that, is that, recording me that. excuse me okay so um pretty much are we just briefing about community affairs and sensitivity between the police and the so uh, hi good evening i thought you uh had signed up because you were given uh the the areas to cover uh, for this night. We were asking for comments on discipline and accountability, the current policing reforms, implementation of past reforms, examining recruitment, hiring, retention, and training, and analyzing data collection and retention practices. Those were the yeah. areas. Yeah, and I did choose an area. I just, I just don't know. Do I just start speaking or? Oh, yes, please, please just go ahead. Okay. So um, the area that I chose was on reform and training um, and just pretty much, you know, speaking about that, um, would I just talk about what ideas I would implement as, as a resident of Los Angeles? Yes, absolutely. And I'm sorry, you weren't here at the beginning. So um, every speaker has 10 minutes. Uh, we will not interrupt you. Uh, we are not going to um, ask questions. It's a listening session where we're hearing from the uh, Angelinos about their ideas and suggestions on police reform. Okay, perfect. Um, you know, so obviously there's a lot of tension, you know, amongst the police officers and the community, and there's a lot of room for reform. So I'm happy that you guys are open to listening. I really appreciate that. And, you know, with that being said, I think that some positive reform would be interaction increased interaction between the police um, and the community, you know, um, really getting to know one another, making a bond between the citizens that the police serve and making friends, if you will, because I think where you build respect, you naturally will build a uniform sense of loyalty and commitment and uh, reform in the community, not just in the in the engagement of the officers. Meaning that I think when officers are engaged in activities like maybe more, you know, sporting activities or more community activities with recreation centers and things like that, where especially starting with the youth, they can start to see the police as friends and not as foes. Um, I think you naturally will breed more more accountability in terms of people not wanting to even commit crime so much because they have a certain amount of allegiance to these officers they respect, you know? And so I think that it's important to build that sort of a liaison between the two, whether, and I know some of this already exists, but I think that it's not broad enough because and speaking with police officer friends of mine, they were saying, well, we already do you know, basketball leagues where we engage the community or baseball leagues and this sort of thing. But when I ask the majority of civilians that I know, they know nothing about these programs. So there's the fallacy. It's like you can have these things existing, but if people aren't hugely aware of them 
and able to participate, then you'll have a very few you reach out to, and then essentially it's a fail. So I think, you know, the way that when I was growing up, the D.A.R.E. program, police officers used to come into schools, talk about, you know, not doing drugs and these sorts of things. I think there should be more outreach programs in every school, but not talking about not doing drugs necessarily, talking about how we can get together, how we can make harmony between the community and the officers, you know, whether that's engaging the kids at rec centers, the YMCA, the, the schoolyards, you know, baseball teams, fashion shows, things boys and girls will love to do, you know, whatever it is, I think we have to create a friendship because what happens in turn is the police won't see the public as expendable animals and as a black community right now, honestly, that's how we feel, you know, and we felt that way for years. The George Floyd thing is interesting and it's wonderful. It's getting so much attention, but growing up, um, with my father being a civil rights attorney, I've always seen this kind of discourse between the community and the police, you know? So I think it's very important to start to see each other as one whole community, not as us and them. And I think the way to do that is to engage people of all ages, but especially the youth, because that's where you have a chance to recreate the thought process, you know, so that we see each other as friends, not foes. The, the trigger happiness of some police officers, I think, has to do some with the fact that many of them fear us. You know, they see us because of racist values built in their consciousness a long time ago in this country. They see us as scary. They see us as animals. They see us as unruly. They see us as all these falsities that are not necessarily true. And as a result, they're quicker to kill us than they are a dog. <laughs> you know, and it's, it's really it's really it's really disheartening. I've had two close friends that I've lost to the police um, that were professionals mistaken identity, sorry, you know, sued, paid their families off, but can't bring their lives back. Um, and with, with, you know, you know, with that being said, both of these were nonviolent incidents. One was shot in the back of the head in his car driving. So, you know, I think, you know, this really does affect me and it affects so many black people. So many of us have lost someone dear to us, to the police and in situations that could have been easily avoided. So I do think that not the community alone needs to see the police as a friend, but the police need to see the community as friends. They need to engage themselves with this different ethnicities, not just when they're um, responding to a crime, you know, because perhaps wherever those particular officers are from, as they've grown up or in their own personal homes, they may not be exposed in a positive fashion to people of different races. So I think that if we create more programs where we have more engagement that everyone knows about, you know, that Saturday mornings in this neighborhood, that neighborhood, this one, that one, so many neighborhoods, you can go play soccer with the police. You can go, you know, you know, play baseball with the police or they're going to come to our school and we're going to have lunch with the police. I think it's so important that we start to know each other. We start to respect one another. We start to really engage one another and not just when there's a crime at hand. I don't know how many minutes I have left. How many minutes do I have? <laughs> you have um, almost three, almost three. Okay, perfect. So it's, it's just like raising a child. You know, when you raise a child, if the response of positive, um, positive reaction and, and, and affirmation is only there, um, is, is never there. And when they do something wrong is the only time that you discipline them, there's always going to be disharmony between that child and that parent because that parent is never there to give positive reward when the, when the child does something good. You know, if the police only step in when we do something wrong, there's always going to be disharmony. You know, so it's very important that positive affirmation is there. When things are good, when things are going great, the police should be there. You know, that's, that's how not only will they gain the respect of the community, but the community will gain respect for them. You know, so that is my idea of a start of some sort of reform is really increasing the engagement of positive activity in schools, rec centers, churches, you know, people of all ages, primarily the kids, but people of all ages, really engaging positive community activity, affirming positive values, not just responding when things are negative and crime ridden. And it's only negative disciplinary action in order. I think that probably was about three minutes worth. <laughs> Very good. Thank you so much for um, coming this evening and sharing your thoughts with us. We truly do appreciate it. Um, and 
uh, we look forward to seeing you again in the near future. Thank you, Ms. Pettit, very much for coming this evening. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. And I appreciate your openness and, uh, you know, willingness to listen to reform ideas. It definitely is what's in need. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Madam Secretary, could you, um, I understand Mr. Rice is on the line, uh, that we were able to have Mr. Rice join us. While we're bringing Mr. Rice up, I'll just uh, restate uh, uh, the um, procedure that we're using this evening, Mr. Rice, is um, every speaker is getting 10 minutes. Uh, you'll see it hopefully on your uh, your platform. And uh, at the one minute marker, if I uh, don't hear you uh, getting close to conclusion, I may uh, jump in and just remind you of the time. So thank you, Mr. Rice, for joining us this, this evening. Uh, please, uh, the floor is yours, sir. Yeah, good evening, everyone. Uh, first and foremost, I just want to thank you all for hosting this forum, this forum and inviting me to speak. Uh, my name is Tony Rice II, and I am a home and business owner in South LA. My professional background includes more than a decade of experience in both the public and private sectors at companies including Deloitte and Google. My educational background consists of an undergraduate degree from Boston University and two graduate degrees from the University of Michigan. My community involvement includes being the former outreach chair for the Park Mesa Heights Community Council. I'm here today on behalf of my company, Archer Street, which is a technology, strategy, and human capital consulting firm headquartered in Los Angeles. We are a minority, local, and small business certified company that spe specializes in collaborating with uh, government agencies and educational institutions. My role is as managing partner and my colleague, Lamar Brown, who is joining me today, is our chief product officer. I currently serve as a trusted advisor to the city of Burbank, working on a portfolio of projects. With cities, I work closely with leadership from multiple departments and divisions, including police, primarily as an IT project manager, implementing technology solutions with multiple vendors. My experience has provided me with unique insight into how to sell, manage, and implement products that truly meets the needs of all stakeholders. Today, I'm here to speak on the topic of data collection and retention. What better way to start than with what has consumed at least the past six months of our lives, COVID-19. I often ask my friends when they started to take the virus seriously. Some say it was when the NBA season was suspended, but most say it was when they saw the numbers, the data. Imagine if we didn't know the coronavirus data until next year and the thousands of lives that would have been lost as a result. That is the state of police complaint data today. Several government agencies collect complaint data, but it is not available to the public real time. In a world where people want to be able to track the status of their food delivery orders from their phones, the data available today doesn't meet the standards or the needs of LA residents and stakeholders. My discussions with people in various oversight roles across the country in cities, including New York City, Seattle, and New Orleans, as well as board members of the National Association for Civilian Oversight of Law Enforcement, NACOL, have proven that there is a need for a product that can better collect and manage complaint data. Also, although I have had my share of negative experiences with police officers, I know that not all officers are bad. My uncle is a military veteran and retired police officers. But too often, those who act inappropriately are overshadowed by those who don't. That is why it is also important to make it convenient for people to provide compliments that will showcase the good that is being done in the community. Our product, Unarmed, will solve those challenges by increasing transparency, improving communication, and as well, as a result, upgrading police safety or public safety. Unarmed is a platform that manages compliments and complaints about law enforcement. During our research, we found that civilians are not only frustrated with the lack of real-time data, but they also don't fully understand the compliment or complaint process and desire more communication after submission. Unarmed streamlines the compliment and complaint process for civilians by creating one portal for civilians to prepare, file, and track their cases. Investigators are then able to utilize a dashboard to perform a variety of functions, including updating the case status, adding attachments, and creating reports. Cities currently use a mix of homegrown and commercially available products that don't provide the functionality or level of transparency that constituents demand. Unarmed will provide a more seamless experience for all involved stakeholders. The first component, Portal, is undergoing market testing with potential customers to gather feedback. 
the second component dashboard is currently in development. I am happy to schedule a demo with anyone interested in seeing the product first, firsthand. You can reach me at Tony at ArcherStreet.com. I want to leave some time to answer any questions that you may have, and thank you for your time and consideration. Uh, thank you, sir. Um, we don't have any questions. It's a forum for people to present their ideas on, on police reform. Uh, we do uh, thank you for uh, coming this, this evening, uh, but uh, it, it's not with all the speakers. We've just allowed them time to speak. Okay. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Um, I understand we're still working on getting the remainder of our, our speakers here. Um, and there were a number of individuals who um, had raised their virtual hands that I'd like to see if they are, are still here. I was told there were a few people who raised their hands. And if so, uh, Commissioner Bonner and I in particular are interested from hearing from you on the issue that has been presented to us tonight and the issue Commissioner Bonner and I have uh, frequently talked about with respect to the uh, topic, a specific topic of uh, community input. And that relates, um, as we've uh, talked about, in the world of where we're living in a pandemic, uh, we do want to get it right. You, uh, some of our, our critics uh, don't believe us, uh, but we do want to hear from people about how to uh, balance the needs to hear from a diverse group of individuals in the community and to, at the same time, um, um, have appropriate uh, time limits on everything. So for tonight, Madam uh, Secretary, if I could ask you to put the clock at uh, two minutes and there were a few people that I was told uh, were um, on uh, in the queue to speak. Um, I'm not sure if they're still here. Um, if T, uh, Paula Minor, I believe it is, P Minor, um, Audrey or Alexandra Nassif, I may be mispronouncing your name, I apologize. If they are here, please uh, call them in order while we attempt to get the um, um, remainder. You know what? Um, I'm told we were successful in getting one of the other speakers here. In the meantime, if you are a member of the public and wish to speak um, at the end, uh, we'll give you a few moments to collect your thoughts and uh, hear from you. Uh, but because we've had um, some uh, challenges in, in getting people in queue, I want to be sure we have an opportunity uh, to take advantage while we have them online. Um, but I'll give everyone um, who is in queue a, a chance to uh, think about the specific question we're asking as to community input. Uh, with that, Madam Secretary, I understand Ms. Lewis, um, who asked to speak at approximately this time, is here. And if you could bring her forward there, I see you've, you've included her. Uh, good evening, Ms. Lewis. Um, hi, good evening. Um, welcome uh, to this forum. Uh, we, um, as you know, um, have asked people to come forward who wish to speak on a variety of topics. And I know that, that you indicated you wanted to speak about reform proposals. Uh, the format tonight is we've set the clock for 10 minutes uh, that I think you were advised uh, you would have. And, yeah. and uh, we will sit and listen to your ideas and suggestions. Uh, it's not a forum where we'll be asking questions. Uh, but we're here to listen to you. Thank you for joining us this evening. We truly appreciate it. Yeah, no, thank you for inviting me. My name is Ebony Lewis. Um, I grew up in Los Angeles, uh, specifically in the Santa Clarita Valley. Valley. If people um, are familiar with that area, it's not the most diverse area. So I have um, have experienced um, and seen um, cop brutality and I just wanted to really promote the fact that there are organizations that are organizing to help and partner with the police officers. And I wanted to bring up um, Eight Can't Wait. I don't know if the panelists have already spoken to those initiatives, but they're very like streamlined, very concrete ideas of like banning chokeholds, requiring de-escalation, a warning before shooting, um, trying to just create alternatives so that people are not being shot at, 
um, having the duty to intervene, um, banning shooting at moving vehicles and requiring um, force, um, require use of force continuum and comprehensive reporting. I'd also like to promote for the Los Angeles County to have um, where, um, to wear um, cameras, body cameras, because I guess we, for some reason, are not doing that. Um, and then also to work with other um, other officers across the country. I, I work in the healthcare environment, and we talk about standardization of care. And um, as a profession, I feel that in order to elevate it, I feel like there should be some standards uh, across the nation. It shouldn't be from one um, police commission to the next that it's there's different rules and policies. It should be the same. Um, I'm also a huge proponent in education. I feel like there needs to be uh, more training and education. I don't think a six month boot camp is enough for our police officers. I feel like they should have um, a a degree and, and have gone to college. I feel like they need to have some life experiences. They have our lives at, in their hands. People are depending on them. Um, they need, if they're feeling like they're, they're fearing people, it's not the right profession for them. So there needs to be some alternative screening process that includes the community. Um, and I overall just feel like, um, we need to elevate the profession to a higher level. I know that defunding the police um, campaign is very sh like shock value, but we need to all like reallocate the resources into people that are professionals at dealing with mental health issues, dealing with the homeless. The police can't do everything. Um, they need to be more focused at what they are there to do and, and that's to protect and serve. Um, as a community um, member and leader, like we're paying um, taxes and I want our tax dollars to be utilized for what is specifically need for them to do their jobs that is aligned with their mission of protecting and serving all people, not just some people. Um, you know, I am wanted to get that out there before I, you know, kind of gave some comp, um, context of why I have the perspective that I have. Um, I was a little girl that was sitting in a car um, when my dad ran out of gas and my mom threw my brother and I to go meet my dad on the side of the road because he ran out of gas and there is a cop that was harassing him and I was five years old and I remember my dad being pulled and thrown to the ground and um, use of excessive force. I remember sitting in the courtroom where we had to deal with that case. Um, I remember Rodney King beating. I went to church with the cops that beat Rodney King. They were at church on that very Sunday. So there just needs to be um, a conversation and there needs to be work that is done to change the culture. I know that culture takes a really long time to change and this is tied to history. And so we need to address the issue now. It's It's been far too long. We are 2020, we're not a third world country that we need to like really utilize all of the, um, you know, resources that we have to offer, partner with one another and really make a difference so that we're caring for each other and caring for the communities that we're serving. And that's all I have to say. I know that was like quick. <laughs> we very much appreciate you coming. Um, as I said earlier, uh, it was a maximum of 10 minutes. You don't have to take all 10 minutes, uh, but we really appreciate you coming this evening, uh, taking time out of your schedule and in presenting. So thank you very much, Ms. Lewis. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening. All right. Um, Madam Secretary, um, uh, if you could, I don't know if there are people uh, still in queue, um, but if uh, I was told earlier that um, Alexandra, I might be pronouncing the last name incorrectly, Nassif, I believe, and Audrey, and then if there are other people in queue, why don't we set the clock at two minutes? and uh, hear from uh, the members of the public who came. And I am, as a reminder, asking you uh, to uh, talk to us 
um, in response to a sincere request of ways in which the commission can improve its ability of obtaining community input on a whole variety of issues, but ensuring that we hear from a vast cross section of the community. So Madam Secretary, why don't you just call uh, people in order if you don't mind. Alexandria, you're on. I'll come back. Okay, we'll come back to her. Okay. We'll go to Audrey. Yes. Um, boy, you really know how to be inconsistent, <laughs> being to, having been told that we were not going to get a chance to speak. Um, I want to. Um, say, first of all, you should never shut down family members in terms of the clock. Um, family members have impacted, um, you know, victims of police brutality. Um, the number of attendees would be so much higher if you would, and I don't know if there's some reason you can't do this, but change the time and date of your meetings. So many people, there, you know, huge things are going on with budgets and, and um, defunding and reimagining um, it at the, at the Board of Supervisors and City Council. And you just can't expect that people, it's wrong to make people make a choice of which venue they're going to attend. You, if you would have a much better representation of community if you would only change the time and date of your regular meetings. Um, you would have better attendance if you would stop bringing in miscellaneous uh, people to speak and, and focus on people who are experts on the architecture of police surveillance and anti-Black racism and policing. There are people who, are, who bring you facts and presentations and reports and show so much knowledge and you totally disregard it and you don't invite them to speak as you should. Um, COVID is no excuse for, for lower attendance, um, you know, or for this attitude you have about um, discouraging dissenting views. Um, also, you need to put emails. When people send you emails, you need to put them in the public record. You, we need to be able to see those emails. I remember when, when you had the vote on the drones, thousands of people, 98% at least of whom were against the use of drones, the drone pro program, the drone um, pilot program. Your time is up, Ms. Uh, I, I think that was Audrey George, Ms. George. And if you have want to make recommendations of experts that you would like to uh, present, uh, please send them to the commission email address. Uh, we will certainly entertain that. Um, and be very happy to. Um, Madam Secretary, the next speaker, please. Next, we have Adam Smith, followed by Jamie Garcia. Oh, hey. Um, Mr. McLean, are you a Toronto fan or a Boston fan? Um, Uh, where'd Mr. Smith go? Did he? I'm sorry, we lost him. Um, oh, there he is. Well, let's see if we can bring him back, please. I'll reset the clock. Thank you. I just thought Mr. Tfang wanted to see my pretty face, make me a panelist. Um, yeah, I just think that, um, I don't know how this advisory committee came about or what, you know, cynically speaking, the relationship between y'all and Eric Garcetti is. Um, it is interesting that if, you know, not counting Mr. T. Fank, 50% of the people on this panel right now uh, are former US attorneys in the Central District, um, where President Decker used to work. But yeah, I just think that this idea of bringing in an advisory committee when the police commission is called on its website, the Citizens Voice in Police Affairs, 
it's held up as some national standard of police oversight in this country. Um, the so fact Mr. That, Mr. Smith, if you don't mind, would you, would you address the question we asked for your ideas, and I'm sure you have many, on how we can get better at providing community input, particularly during this pandemic, sir? That was the question? That's yeah. Um, if you dismantle Metro Division, less people will be uh, wanting to ask you questions. If you um, dismantle the police department, um, a lot of racist violence would cease to happen in Los Angeles and less people would call to complain. Go Celtics. All right, I uh, guess Mr. Smith is done. Madam Secretary, could you call the next person, please? Okay, next we have Jamie Garcia, followed by Marina Vergara. Hi, can you hear me? Hi, yes. So, um, you know, I think we have to reconsider what time these um, advisory <clears throat> committee listening sessions are happening. We're starting at four o'clock and we still have to realize that people are working from home still or in working at the hospitals. I'm a registered nurse. I'm highly involved in the workings of LAPD, understanding surveillance, understanding what's going on and unable to participate and having to, you know, do other things to get involved, to be able to participate in this. So that's one thing, but I really want to uplift what Audrey George was also saying in the sense that, um, you know, thinking about when the commission meetings are regularly happening on a Tuesday when nobody can participate with without COVID, it's impossible, board of supervisors, um, city councils happening all at the same time. It's like we're getting pulled in multiple directions when there's a massive amount of people who wanna participate, who wanna be very involved. And this is actually sending the message of like, don't get involved because we're not gonna make the space and the time for you to get involved. Second of all, I don't understand who you are inviting. I mean, the whole component of data collection was an absolute insult. I mean, now we're talking about data collection in regards to complaint processes. We have to understand the history of the commission where over thousands and thousands of complaints about biased policing have been filed and none of them have been sustained. And now you wanna automate that and act as if we're gonna believe that you're gonna sustain any kind of process. You do not believe the public. You never have believed the public. So that's not the kind of data collection we wanna talk about. What we wanna talk about is data collection, data storage, data sharing, predictive analytics, um, algorithmic technologies. We wanna talk about the records management system. We wanna talk about the new input national incident-based reporting system that's gonna happen. And you give the Stop LAPD Spying Coalition 10 minutes to speak about this stuff. We have a plethora of knowledge that the community does not know about because we are underfunded. We, are, we only have so many of us that are out there really talking. Thank you. Thank and you, Ms. Garcia, and I would ask Ms. Garcia if you have more to add to, to please uh, provide it to us in the, and if you're not able to complete it in the 10 minutes that's been provided to you in a coming week, to, to please let us know in the email address. We'd very much appreciate it. I'm sorry, Madam Secretary, please go on. Okay, next we have Marina Vergara followed by Hamid Khan. This commission has not listened to the people of LA. My brother, Daniel Hernandez, was murdered. When will I and the other families be invited to the table? We have a voice and you will hear us. This commission does not represent the city of LA. You continue to ignore us, but in order to move forward, you have to engage with us in this process. Black Lives Matter has been leading this movement. When will you meet with them? You have structured your meetings in a way that limit our input to one minute, two minutes. I have to provide context to my brother's, to my brother's story every time. You, this is a sham, this is a sham. You allowed other speakers. I requested to be a speaker for 10 minutes so I could give my brother's story, so I can share some of the other family story. You had someone represent about selling you a product. You had someone who wasn't even prepared to speak, an actor. When are you going to engage with the families? When? I'm still waiting. You have my email. You have my phone number. Call
call me. I want to be at the table. The other families want to be at the table. You want to build trust. You want to build community trust, public trust. You want to restore that. We don't want to be friends with LAPD. LAPD can never repair the relationship and the trust they have broken with our families. Never. They took my brother's life and the other life because they refused to de-escalate because these officers feel that they are above the law. Prosecute killer cops, remove the protections that they have and qualified immunity. Have independent investigation. Thank you. Uh, next we have Hamid Khan. And before Mr. Khan comes up, I will only say that uh, we are deeply sorry for the pain that you are feeling. I think every human being would feel that way. Uh, we have reached out through the crisis response team to ensure that you have the services that you need. Um, they have reached out multiple times. If you are in need of those services, please know that they are there for you. Please continue, Madam Secretary. Okay, Hamid Khan. Yeah, hi. Uh, I think Marina Bergera's comment just says it all. Uh, the question really is that rather than you sitting over there, Octavio, Octavio Pedroza, Rasha Shields, Byron McLean, Alma Derex, uh, you should be speaking to the community. The question is, where do you claim the authority? What is your knowledge base? How often have you been out in the community? What have you studied about policing or surveillance? What is the level of your this knowledge is, um, as to how I'm these things, and I'm speaking about reform. I'm speaking I'm about asking the, you reform. the question that we asked. The question is coming to the COVID piece as well. So, so just be patient and that's the whole thing because how this is how you're making a mockery of the whole system. Well, that's Ms. why I'm it is it was said you to that- to answer the question. Yes. So now what you're doing is you've established a system where you are bringing people in and it's, it's again making a mockery of people's pain and trauma. And I think at some point this has to stop and the, the earlier speakers have already talked about it. Earlier speakers talked about that over the last 50 years you've had these bodies, outside bodies who have come in to babysit the police commission and nothing has changed. So now you're asking us questions, Ms. Decker, to answer about these things. I mean, what answers are you expecting? It's a community who's seeking answers. It's a community who's seeking that why should we even place an iota of trust in these bodies? So, so this groundbreaking reform effort, I mean, I would want to know what your knowledge base is, Rasha Shields. What do you know about the surveillance? Sir, sir, if you're not going How is that to data on COVID question. going to be collected? I, I asked you records? a legitimate question I'm going to that. about how, how is that data on COVID policing sir. going to be used? Where is that data on COVID policing going to be shared with? How does Palantir, that is a central data processing system, which is already uh, uh, responsible for mass deportations going to use that COVID data. What is the relationship with LAPD with, with uh, uh, companies like Palantir? What is their relationship with companies like who are doing data processing as well? So, so I think we need to, we need to really stop this charade as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, next we have Paula Miner and- And that's our last speaker, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. All right, uh, we'll go to Ms. Miner and Ms. Miner, you- you might recall that the question we asked um, is, uh, given the criticisms of not obtaining sufficient community input, we would like your ideas, suggestions on areas where we can get better, particularly in the time of this pandemic. Thank you, Ms. Miner. Yeah, and, and I'm having difficulty understanding the question because you're asking how you can get better in times of this pandemic. pandemic. Um, in my opinion, there was no opportunity for those people who wanted to participate to be allowed to participate. It was by invitation only by the mayor, um, these appointees to this advisory commission and whoever else the mayor felt would be appropriate. I feel like that a lot of times you are afraid to hear from those members of the community who have been most negatively impacted by what LAPD has done. Um, I feel like that we need to reach out. We need to hear from those people. I know you all are afraid of it because um, there was kind of an open forum in early June where a lot of people 
I know you opened it up and went to five, six, seven, eight o'clock, but this is what the people are feeling. They are feeling sad. They are feeling frustrated. They're feeling tired. We talk about LAPD and reforming it over and over again. Nothing changes. There are so many things talked about in commission by Chief Moore that do not seem to reach the officers in the street. You t there is a comprehensive escalation plan developed by LAPD. The officers on the street do not seem to be aware of it. There are all kinds of public relations efforts that go on. These do not reach the officers. Officers still continue to do racial biasing, continue to do harassing, con continue ultimately to harm and tarnish the community. So, you know, you ask us, how can you improve? You know, I'm so frustrated at this point. I'm not sure if you can improve, but I hope we can. We need to. We need to stop the police violence, the police harassment. Thank you, Ms. Miner. We appreciate your comments very much. Um, thank you for coming this evening and to all the members of the public. And I will only say um, several times tonight, I've said if you had ideas, suggestions of groups that should present to send it to the commission email. So we are uh, very open to ideas and suggestions. Yes, invitations went out, uh, but it has not been exclusive, not even tonight, where at least one, uh, perhaps two people said they heard about it from someone else and asked to participate. So we are open, we are receptive. Uh, and as should be clear from this evening, we are we listen to criticism uh, a lot and we do strive to get better. And that's in part what these forums are about. We realize there are many who disagree with us. We respectfully uh, are very open to hearing from you and listening and striving to get better, not just as a police commission, but in our oversight of the department. Um, thank you all for attending this evening. It was the first in what will be a series of public forums, and we look forward uh, to seeing you at least virtually in the future. Thank you very much, everyone. And thank you to um, all the people um, on the panel who were able to attend this evening. Thank you so much. Good night and please stay safe.